Good morning, good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom event. My name is Joe Gabrowski from National Geographic and I'll be your host for today. All month long, we have been celebrating big cats. We do this every December uh, with scientists and explorers from places like in North America, South America, Africa, uh, and across Asia. We love to celebrate our big cats here uh, and speak to scientists and explorers from all over the world who have dedicated their lives uh, to protecting big cats and conserving their habit habitat. Uh, to researching them, as well as creating and collecting media that they can share out with the general public to help us fall in love with them uh, and do what we can to protect them and their valuable habitats. So all month long, we've had classrooms from across North America joining us live for the events. And time flies because we're hitting the end of December. Holidays are starting shortly. And we're at our last uh, Explore classroom for the month uh, and for the year of 2019. So we've got a really good one uh, to end us off for today. We have Malika Vaz joining us today. She's an adventurer and wildlife presenter. Uh, she recently was awarded a National Geographic grant to create a three-part digital series on the relationship that communities share with Asiatic lions, leopards, and tigers in India. She's also deeply interested in telling the stories of human-animal conflict and coexistence, as well as exposing illegal trade in wildlife and contraband. So she's a national level windsurfer, a paddy dive master, an endur endurance horse rider, sailor, kayaker, and Cessna pilot. Her adventures have included following the trail of Genghis Khan on horseback from Mongolia to Russia, kayaking in Greenland, wreck diving around unexplored islands, and even surfing in Palestine. Um, so really excited for today's event. Great classrooms from across North America with us. If you're tuning in on YouTube, don't forget you can get in on the action. Uh, use the chat sidebar, let us know where you're watching from and send in some questions. But uh, uh, Malika, we're so excited to have you joining us live today. We're excited to get to know you a little bit better and then let the students fire away with a little Q&A action. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Joe. And I'm so, so excited to be able to connect with students from across North America today and talk about my story. Um, to begin with, I'd love to tell the kids a bit more about how I got started because I am 22 um, and I've been doing this since I was 18 full time. But for me, it was growing up in a place which was right on the coast. I spent a lot of time out at sea. I would be diving and I would be windsurfing. And when I was really, really young, I actually had the opportunity to see an enormous humpback whale on one of my windsurfing trips. Um, it literally just jumped out of the water. And I remember thinking to myself that there's so much biodiversity right in my backyard um, and I haven't explored it more. So that's how I got into diving. I'm just going to share my keynote with you as well so you guys can have a look at that so that's how I got into diving and I realized very soon that um, for me exploring the underwater world wasn't enough I had to share that with other people around me and that's how I got into wildlife filmmaking and presenting for the first couple of uh, films that I made, they were all focused on tigers specifically, but then I began to see how it was really important to talk about the, the broader context of these animals and the ecosystems that depend on their survival. So for the last couple of years, I have been doing stuff with smaller animals as well. But right after high school and right when I was in high school, I started an organization that works with women who are victims of violence along with a couple of my friends. Um, and the goal was to get people from these really disadvantaged backgrounds to go out and explore the world around them. So then you can see them in one of the pictures, climbing mountains in the Himalayas. Some of the kids are learning how to swim. Some of Malika, I just want to pause you just for one second. I don't think the screen share worked. Um, okay, one yeah. second. You hit the share at the bottom first and then pick the keynote. Uh, I'll let you know if it works this time. There we go. We got it. We got it. Yep. Perfect. So this is the picture of me windsurfing. This is where I grew up in Goa. Um, and then right after I started diving a lot. And then I realized that I needed to kind of share my adventures with people from different backgrounds. So I started this nonprofit in Maharashtra that works with these incredible, incredible women. Um, and slowly through this project, I kind of realized how transformative the outdoors can be. Um, but Unfortunately, you can't take everyone to the Himalayas. You can't take everyone scuba diving. You can't take everyone to all of these remote wild places on our planet. And I realized that media could. So that's why I decided to get into wildlife filmmaking and presenting. So this is me in a forest in um, India where I was filming for one of my first shoots at 18. Um, 
at that point, I was really, really unsure about what specifically I wanted to focus on. But over time, I realized there were four main themes of my work. The first is bringing the wild closer home. So kind of highlighting that you don't have to go somewhere really far off into some remote national park to be able to witness the natural world. It could be right outside your backyard. This animal was found in a small little community right outside where I live in Bangalore today. Um, another one of my core interests as a filmmaker is protecting unpopular critters, protecting animals like this beautiful, beautiful purple frog um, that is found in the Western Ghats in India. And then finally talking about the human side of the story because very often we think about the natural world as inviolate and we think about it as completely separate from our own lives. But the reality is that communities live alongside these big majestic predators that we often think about. And we need to start telling their stories as much as we do the stories of the wildlife. And then finally documenting solutions and telling stories of hope. So, um, before I show you my big cat project, I want to show you a trailer to this show that with Discovery Channel and with Animal Planet, which is focused on lesser known animals. Having some trouble with the tech here, just a second. Those eyes are so mesmerizing. Those eyes are so mesmerizing. It's hard to look away. Loris has evolved much before monkeys. They became nocturnal as a clever strategy to avoid competition for food and space. To adapt to the night, their eyes have a reflective layer in the back that gives them excellent night vision. We're filming with infrared light so the animals won't be disturbed and we can witness their natural behavior. Harsh light can temporarily blind slender lorises. The only drawback with infrared is the inability to see a range of colors. This is the Mysore gray slender loris, found only in the Eastern Ghats in India. Lorises constantly groom themselves. Their second toenail is called the toilet claw, and it's assumed that this has been designed for cleaning. I'm a bit overwhelmed by what I'm seeing right now. I can hear the city sounds in the distance. This just goes to show that the natural world is not out there, living in isolation and distinct from us. It's right here, in our backyards. Um, so that's the thing that I did with Discovery Channel last year, and it was a great way to reach out to people all across the Indian subcontinent about stories of the wild. And then I realized that I really wanted to tell stories of big cats, because big cats are these incredible emblematic animals that people associate with India. But I wanted to tell stories that could help us to understand how their neighbors coexist with them. And their neighbors in this particular situation are tribal communities. So I'm just gonna show you the big cats, the most feared members of the animal kingdom, struggling to find space in modern India. As the city expands rapidly into some of our last remaining wild spaces, humans and big cats are being forced to confront one another. But in some pockets, people are learning to live with big cats. But what is the secret behind this coexistence? To find out, I'm embarking on a journey of a lifetime. This forest is where the natural world meets the historical world. Getting up close with these incredible predators. She's literally five strides away from me right now. I'm meeting the communities and rangers on the front lines. Mobile technology is playing such a big role in the fight against wildlife trafficking. To understand what it's really like to have big cats as neighbors. It's super tense right now. If we keep the tiger's neighbors happy, the tiger is happy. This is a story of coexistence I've never seen before. I'm Malaika and I'm looking for the extraordinary relationship that some communities share with big cats in India.
Yes, um, so that's a trailer of the show that I just made along with my National Geographic Explorer grant. And for me, that was so incredibly exciting to work on because it was the first time that I was able to tell stories that I truly, truly care about and kind of design that from the ground up. Um, so basically, each story talks about one local community and how they've managed to protect the animals. And what I found most striking about making this entire you know series was that when I went into the field I kind of had this assumption that you know a lot of tribal communities are often the enemies of conservation that you know when a tiger is walking through a village people are often you know against it but what I realized was that that tiger often exists in that village only because the kid in that village cares deeply or because the grandfather has a spiritual belief or because one of the young men in the village is an active anti-poacher so he basically will go out he will patrol and he'll make sure that no one attacks the animals that live right next to him so the biggest takeaway from making the series along with my teammate was that without people we can't have big cats yeah um and then since then i've been working on other films as well so currently i'm working on a film which is an investigative documentary on the illegal trade in manta rays across southeast asia so the aim of that film is to kind of show how manta rays which are these beautiful animals that we see underwater are being extremely extremely threatened by a global demand for their gill plates so um, to, to help you understand a little bit more, in China, there's traditional Chinese medicine, which often uses animal parts. And in the last 10 to 15 years, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, manta rays have really come under the hammer for the fact that their gill plates are seen to possess certain qualities, even though they actually do not. Um, so I've been following the trade pipeline from India to Myanmar and finally to the markets in Hong Kong and in China. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures from that, just so you know what a manta ray looks like. Can you see that, Joe? Uh, try and hit the share screen again for us, Malika. I don't see it yet. Mm -hmm. One second. That's better. Yeah. So that's a manta ray and that's a picture that I took when I was in uh, a boat on the east coast of India. This manta ray was killed by fishermen and its gill plates were cut soon after I took this image, which were then transported to China for use in traditional Chinese medicine. So through this documentary, I'm trying to figure out ways that we can get people in India to both fall in love with these species. Um, little kids like these who play with manta rays without even knowing what the animal looks like underwater and help them to have that connection with the natural world. And of course, we're also hoping to use the film to look at policy solutions to figure out how we can get these manta rays protected in India and give them the same level of protection that, say, tigers receive in our country. So that's the current project that I'm working on um, in India right now. But besides that, I think that one of the things that I would say to all of the young people out there tuning in right now is that you're never ever too young to go out there and make a change. You're never too young to go out there and make a story, to tell a story about something you care deeply about. I started telling my first couple of stories when I was 12 years old. I was a presenter for a local TV channel in Goa, where I'm from. And even though there are stories that in retrospect, I'm very embarrassed by sometimes, I now realize that you are never too young to tell a story and we need more young people from across the world to tell stories of communities that they know, people that they have access to, wildlife that they care about. And when more young people start telling stories, we really, really can band together and create an impact. All right, absolutely. Uh, well, Maika, what um, led you to do this in the first place? What what did you did you see a documentary? Did you meet someone? Um, did you notice something happening in your community? What made you want to grab a camera and turn your lens on the stories that you were seeing? So growing up, I watched a lot of wildlife documentaries on television, whether that was the BBC or National Geographic or Discovery. And I was always so in awe of the fact that you had all of this amazing wildlife and these pristine ecosystems. But what also really shocked me when I started traveling was that I was seeing so much degradation. I was seeing 
you know, pristine rainforests being cut, I was seeing forest fires, I was seeing animals that were being killed for the wildlife trade, but very little of that was being reflected on television. Very little of that was being shown, you know, in classrooms and to young people. So you kind of grow up thinking that the natural world looks a certain way, but when you get out there, it's completely different. So for me, the reason I wanted to be a filmmaker and the reason I care so deeply about wildlife filmmaking and storytelling is because it's an opportunity to tell stories that both are nuanced and at the same time provide you with hope. Both tell the story of the way the situation is on the ground and also highlight solutions so that people can be a part of those solutions. All right. So I think a lot of students tuning in will know that there's tigers in India. Some might know that there's leopards, but I think very few students know that outside of Africa, there's a small population of Asiatic lions. Can you tell us a little bit about those lions? Yes. Yeah, so the Asiatic lions in India are quite incredible, really. And I think what's important about their story is that they've bounced back from the brink of extinction. If you look at the status of Asiatic lions, probably around 50 years back, we had very, very few in India. And now we have a sizable population in the forests of Gujarat in Gir. Um, and very often when people hear that, you know, we have Asiatic lions, they're completely taken away. But for anyone traveling to India, I would totally recommend that you come and find out the story of not just the Asiatic lions, but the communities that live alongside them. To give you an example, when I was filming in Gujarat, we were, um, I think it was about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, we were in a farmer's mango orchard and we saw two lions mating in the middle of the day. So we had two lions mating in the middle of the day and it was completely shocking because for me, I've always seen, you know, lions as animals that are within the constraints of a national park. But here we had lions in people's backyards and people's homes and the people, the communities, there was so nonchalant about the entire day, to be honest. Um, I'd love to show you a short video of me with a couple of lions. And the story over here that I was trying to focus on was the story of the researchers and the forest guards that are working to protect these animals. Can you see it? Yep. Finally, we see her. Thankfully, she looks healthy and not in any danger. You know, you always have this impression of lions as being these ferocious animals based on what you see in the media. But right now, I'm five strides away from this animal and her calm and composure is just really touching me. This is amazing. These are the men that are at the front lines of the conservation of the Asiatic lion and the hours that they put in on a daily basis, tracking and protecting the lions in gear really will make a difference to the survival of this entire species. All right, very cool. And do you find, so you spend a lot of time in the community, you spend a lot of time talking to people on a whole, Whole, do you find that um, you know they, they they like having the wildlife close, um, and that they understand that they're part of you know the ecosystem as well, or do the the pressures of protecting cattle and um, you know crops and things like that is, is that too great? To be honest, I would say that it's a bit of both. There's no simple answer to this question. On one hand, you definitely have a lot of loss that is created by these big cats. You have livestock like cows that are really expensive for these farmers that are taken away on a weekly basis, sometimes in a village. Um, you have the threat to life as well. Many farmers are so scared to leave their homes and venture into the field at night because they might be killed by a lion or a tiger. Um, so I feel like the losses are substantial, but at the same time, um, you have this incredible tolerance in India where I feel like unlike any country in the world, in fact, we have managed to live alongside wildlife. I mean, we have upwards of a billion people in our country, and yet we managed to have so many big cats, so many incredible large predators roaming around our villages, our forests. But I think honestly, the, the real trick is to find solutions that help both people and wildlife. Like for example, making sure that development that come in, comes into a region is sustainable and therefore the long-term as opposed to extractive. Um, 
we have a lot of you know roads that are being built through national parks in india and that's really difficult not just for the communities but also for the big cats right now that are completely suffering a loss of habitat whereas you also have sustainable tourism which is coming in and that sustainable tourism often brings in much larger benefits over a 20 year life um time span as opposed to you know a two year time span so i think it's important to look at solutions that both help local communities and big cats and in the situations where i mentioned initially where you have a lot of loss um there are many ways that scientists are working on currently to mitigate those um mitigate that conflict but i think one of the key ways is to make sure that the communities feel like they have a say you know when a cow is taken away from a family you have to ensure that the family gets that money recompensated to them within a short span of time when a person is killed by a tiger you have to make sure that people are there to support that family in that difficult time and that we're equally looking out for the family as we are for the tigers all right well, I think it's time that we meet some of our classrooms and get some questions. So we're going to start off. We're going to head to uh, Alabama. We've got some third graders hanging out with Mrs. Sullivan. So I'm going to turn their microphone on. How are we doing, third graders? Hello. All right. Who's got a question? Good question. Nobody has a question. Oh, Jake has one. Go, Jake. Oh. Talk really loud. I'm not in the camera. Okay, that's talk really loud. You can stand up. Um, I have a question. <laughs> Hi, Jake. Um, I do the tigers in India. How big is their population? Like how um, much are there in India? How many tigers do we have in India? I'm just gonna dig out the recent statistic because the numbers keep changing. But there was a recent statistic done very, very recently in the last few months. So I want to tell you the exact population number. Just hold on. While you're looking for that, have you been lucky enough to see them in the wild on a few, a few, few times? Yes, I have. Um, so India has up about 3,000 tigers now. And, and uh, just a couple of years back, we had less than 1,000 tigers. So our population has really, really increased in the last few years. But what's incredible about the tiger population is that it has increased within national parks, which is, you know, areas where the government has said that they're completely inviolate and, you know, only wildlife can exist there. And as a result, the tiger population is now moving into human dominated landscapes. So we definitely have had a huge success in terms of the tiger population growing, but we also have to deal with the impact of that on, you know, the human communities that live right next to the tiger. All right. Great question from our third graders. We'll come back to you guys in a little bit. Uh, see if you have another one, but let's take a little visit. Uh, we're going to go to Canada this time. In Ontario, we have Mr. Atkinson's got some students with them. It's a snow day there, believe it or not. So there's uh, less students than usual, but let's see who we've got hanging out with us today. How are we doing, boys and girls? <laughs> okay. Does someone have a question? Um, yeah. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I okay. Yeah. Um, so like how, how hard, like how hard was it for you to learn like all the stuff that you learned to protect the tigers and everything? So do you mean the filmmaking stuff or do you yeah, mean? How long did it take for you to like learn how to, um, like film without disturbing the animals? That's a really good question. So right before I got into making films on my own, I actually worked at a production house as an intern first and then as a researcher. And I learned all of the skills about, you know, camera work, about the basics of editing, how to be on camera, how to direct, how to write a script. So that really helped me when I got into the field. But one of the most important lessons I learned when I was filming in this place called Ranthambor was that you always have to ensure that you keep a respectful distance from the tigers. Right. Um, sometimes as filmmakers, we can get really, really excited about getting that amazing shot of the tiger coming straight up to the camera. But um, for me, what's most important is that we tell stories that are representative. We tell stories that are great for the animals and great for the people that watch them. So I always make sure that, you know, when I go in to tell a story, A, I'm being respectful of the animals that I'm filming. I'm ensuring that I'm far enough from them. I'm ensuring that I'm never, ever um, intruding in a way that is um, damaging in any way. But also, I always try to ensure that when I go into a place, I do my research beforehand, right? 
um, I don't just show up on a location and hope to tell a story. I make sure that I read every source of, um, you know, literature that I possibly can get my hands on about that location. So, for example, if I'm making a film about tigers in Taduba National Park, which is in Maharashtra, close to the city of Bombay, I would read every article that I can find that scientists have written about that area, about the communities that live there, about the behavior of these animals, that when I get into the field, I'm completely prepared to tell a story that is, you know, nuanced and exciting and also impactful. All right. Let's take a little trip now to Laredo, Texas. We have some students hanging out with Mrs. Salazar. Let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Texas? Good. Good. All right, does anyone have a question uh, for us? Well, how long have you been studying the big cats? So I've been deeply fascinated with big cats since I was three or four years old. That's all I ever wanted to do. I wanted to hang out with tigers in the wild, but I didn't realize that I had to, I could be a filmmaker and do that. So initially I wanted to be a wild tiger biologist, a wildlife biologist, and pursue the path of science to spend time with animals. But very soon when I was 18, I realized that I could also be a filmmaker and you know, spend time with animals and tell the stories of their ecosystems and um, their behavior. So I've been obsessed with big cats and with tigers since the time I was a little girl, but I've been actively making films about big cats for the last four years now. All right. I've got a question from YouTube about conservation uh, with tigers in India. So obviously national parks have a finite amount of space. Is there any conservation work where tigers are being moved to different parks? Yeah, so there is a, there are a couple of efforts where tigers are being relocated, but I feel like um, one of the most amazing solutions that I had the opportunity to document recently was on the outskirts of Rantambo National Park. So basically you have this national park where you have you know, a concentration of about roughly 63 tigers. Um, and now these tigers are dispersing into human dominated landscapes. But the forest guards, the guys who are tasked with protecting these animals can't be outside of the national parks. They can't be in every village, right? So an innovative approach has been to train villagers, train local communities to set up camera traps, to monitor poaching activity, to apprehend poachers, and to look out for the tigers. And I feel like that is a phenomenal approach to conservation because A, you're involving the local communities in conservation, and B, it's an opportunity to reach scale, right? To ensure that you have watchful eyes on these tigers in different parts of India. So I feel like empowering local communities to be conservation stakeholders is the way forward and making sure that they have the skills of technology and the skills of camera trapping to be able to do that successfully is important as well. Absolutely. It makes such a good point about bringing the community in and making uh, them feel a part of the effort. And then once animals like big cats are viewed as important economic resources for the community, uh, then they become worth more alive and protected. So definitely a smart way to bring conservation into local communities um, and always better than coming and telling people what to do, showing them is much more, uh, sure. yeah. I would also recommend that for people who are more interested in understanding about tiger conservation in India, you must check out this website called Tiger Watch. Um, it's an organization that I collaborated with recently on my National Geographic Early Career Grant. And they do such phenomenal work with anti-trafficking, with um, working with local communities, with working with the children of poachers. So I would definitely recommend checking their work out as well. All right, very cool. Well, let's take another swing through our live classrooms. Let's start off back in Alabama and see if they have another question for us. Thank you, Ms. Reeves. I'll ask you a question. Okay, back here. See if you can stand up over here so they can see you. Maybe let's stand by and follow. Hi, this is Frankie. Hi, this is Frankie. Hi, Frankie. Um, um, how many tigers have you seen in your life? In my life, I think I must have seen more than 50 tigers, actually. From the time I was little to now, I've probably seen over 50 tigers in the wild. Um, and I've also had the opportunity to spend multiple weeks with one tiger. So I feel like watching a tiger from the time that, you know, um, you're young to the time that they're older is quite interesting. Recently, when I was in Ranthambore, actually four years back when I was in Ranthambore, I'm 
saw this mother and her young cubs and the cubs were all of like three weeks old so they were as tiny as little puppies really and then I went back to film this year so like four years later and one of the tigresses one of the cubs has now grown up into a full female adult tigress and I actually had the opportunity to watch her hunt so to see you know a little tiger cub growing up into a big female tigress was one of the most amazing moments for me personally with tigers all right very cool 50 that's that's incredible that's pretty awesome um so we talked to some scientists over the last couple of weeks who use radio tracking technology so they'll put gps or radio collars on uh lions on jaguars on leopards is the same thing done in india as well are there some uh tigers being tracked that way a lot of tigers are being tracked actually one of the first tigers that i filmed his name is jay um, he unfortunately passed away and they don't really know what the reason for that was, but he did have a tracker on him. And I remember in the last few days when he was missing, um, entire search teams comprising of people from the forest department and other government officials were using that tracking system to find out where he was. Um, so I feel like, yes, that has definitely come to India, but we also have a really robust forest department in India, which definitely keeps its eye out on tigers, even when they aren't radio collared. Um, and I feel like that's incredible because they have camera traps set up all across the park. Some of them are fearless, fearless soldiers who will walk through the national park at night, will walk through the national park during the day. Um, they have close encounters with these tigers and they're all really driven by their passion to protect these animals in the wild. All right. Uh, let's take another visit to Ontario, see if our snow day class has another question for us. Um. What inspired you to follow Genghis Khan's path and what did you learn from him? Follow Genghis Khan's path? Yeah, she's wondering what inspired you to do that. What did you learn from it? That's a cool question. So I've always been a fan of, you know, understanding more about the world around us. I feel like we have like 80 years on this planet. That's not very much or 90 or 100 but that's not very much. And I wanna make sure that I pack my life with as much exploration and as much learning as I possibly can. So I've always been inspired by explorers like Genghis Khan. I mean, he had his problems, but explorers like Genghis Khan, explorers like Shackleton in Antarctica. Um, and I wanted to understand more about how I could use my passion for adventure sport with my passion for exploration. And horse riding across Mongolia was definitely one of those things that allowed me to do that. With my film work in the next couple of years, I definitely want to spend more time windsurfing and scuba diving and horse riding and mountaineering and using those adventure sports as ways to connect with the natural world. All right, that's pretty cool. I want to ask about the, the windsurfing. Are you still competing at a national level? Yes, yeah, so I do. I don't compete at national level very often, but I will be competing at the next, next regatta. Um, I still windsurf almost every, you know, three months at least. Whenever I go back home to Goa, where I'm from, I'm constantly windsurfing. And for me, um, it's a sport that's really close to my heart because that's how I got into, you know, falling in love with the world outside, falling in love with the outdoors. So whenever I'm, you know, having a stressful day, I try to make sure that I go back home and windsurf because that's how I can you know, clear my mind and think again. All right. Very cool. Uh, I'll check in with our class in Laredo one more time, see if they have another question for us. Uh, how did you get involved in National Geographic? So this is a great question for all of the kids who are, you know, nearing 18 right now. But um, so I basically read about the National Geographic Explorer grants and I was so, so excited to know that someone who is 18, if you have an idea, if you have something that you care deeply about and you want to go out and do, National Geographic will give you the monetary and the mentorship support to kind of go out there and do that. So I applied for a grant online. I received a grant to do a project on Big Cats, which is my three-part series called Living with Predators. And it was the most exciting experience to be able to be trusted with the responsibility of creating a project from beginning to end. So if you have an idea that you care about, if you have something that you want to do, it doesn't have to be storytelling. It could be research. It could be something related to education. It could be something related to an expedition. If there is something that you want to do and you feel like you can't possibly do right now with your means, I would definitely recommend applying for National Geographic Explorer Grant. They're a great way to get started. 
um, and get your way into the National Geographic family, I'd say. Absolutely. We on Explore Classroom regularly host uh, young explorers who got their first grant through National Geographic, really young, around 18 years old, um, and for a variety of things, whether it's a little research project, uh, creating media, videos, documentaries, things like that. There's all kinds of ways that you can get an early start in the Nat Geo family, uh, researching something in your local community or something outside of it. So pretty cool opportunities. Yeah. So before I take one more question from YouTube, I want to see if any of our camera classrooms want one more question. Give me a wave if I need to come back and visit your class. Well, oh yeah, we gotta go back to Alabama. Let's go back to Alabama. One more question from our group there. Um, did anybody get hurt when y'all were making the, um, the show? The television show? Yeah. Um, no, so I, none of us got hurt, thankfully. Um, but we did have a couple of close calls, to be honest. I was actually in this place in, um, in Arunachal Pradesh, which is a very, very cold part of India. And I was walking on this um, like glacial lake. So it was completely frozen over. And while I was doing the shot where I was walking across, basically I walked in that ice path too many times and the ice got thinner and thinner with each time that I walked on it. And finally, when I was walking back to where my car was and I was about you know half a kilometer from where the rest of my crew was, the ice kind of caved in. So the ice caved in and I fell into this freezing, freezing cold water. And I was honestly a bit scared initially, but then I managed to pull myself out and get out of that. So I have had close encounters with black bears. I've had close encounters with rhinos when I've been filming for different projects. I've had close encounters with tigers. But I think that if you make sure that you have a team that has their, you know, is always, always has your back. And if you're looking out for yourself and you're making sure that you're not getting into unnecessary um, risky situations, you usually will be fine. Wildlife filmmaking is super expensive exciting and it's not that dangerous yeah absolutely so that's another theme that's come up a few times this month is questions about working with big cats and actually a lot of the scientists shared similar things it's sometimes just where you are whether it's falling out of a tree or slipping on some rocks and things like that that can be more dangerous than actually working uh, with the wildlife you have to be careful in your environment yeah all right so let's grab that last question from youtube and this question is about poaching so uh this class is wondering about uh how strictly enforced it is and what the punishment would be like if you were caught um either in the act or with say a tiger skin so the the punishment for poaching is pretty high in india so we have something called the wildlife protection act which is an act that was you know enforced in 1972 in india and it basically has different animals listed on that in different schedules so tigers receive the highest level of protection under this, under schedule one. So if someone was to be caught poaching a tiger, killing a tiger, they would go to jail. But um, one of the things that I've been focusing in the last four years is also find, finding solutions to document and protect animals that aren't on the Wildlife Protection Act. And with, for example, manta rays, they're protected by the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species, um, also called CITES, but they aren't protected by India's laws. So what often happens when an animal, unlike the tiger, but smaller animals often um, are protected by international treaties and not national laws, is that very often they do come under the hammer and there's no law that can protect them from that. So we're trying to get manta rays listed onto the Wildlife Protection Act so that they can receive the same level of protection that tigers receive in India. But I think one of the most important things with stopping wildlife trade and with stopping poaching is to ensure, of course, that there are really, really um, strict punishments for poaching, but also to ensure that you're giving back to the community in terms of reviving the economy, in terms of providing them with different opportunities for employment. And I think that that's often a much more effective way of ensuring that you reduce poaching. Like, for example, in places where you have a lot of poaching, providing the kids of these poachers or providing the poachers themselves with an education would often help them to get out of this, you know, really, really vicious cycle of poaching and then living in um, places like that. No question. Most poachers don't want to be doing what they're doing, but they're driven to it by need, right? They need to make a living. They need to look after their families. So education, um, jobs and conservation is, is key. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, Malika, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. I want to give a huge shout out to our classrooms on YouTube and our camera classrooms today. 
Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Happy holidays. Enjoy the rest of your week. And Malika, you're doing awesome work. Keep it up. Keep getting that media out there. Uh, we look forward to definitely another Explore Classroom in the new year with you. Thank you so much. It was so exciting to talk to all of you incredible people. All right, boys and girls. Bye. Your microphones are on. Let's get nice and loud. Big goodbye and thank you. Bye. 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 All right. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for hanging out during our last Explorer classroom of 2019. We'll see you all uh, in the new year. Thanks, everyone.